Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Mitchell Pearson. And if you like this video, make sure to subscribe, make sure to hit that like button. I would appreciate it. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at Azure Data Factory. We're specifically going to be looking at Wrangling Data Flows. Now, it's been a while since I've done a Data Factory video. I've been off in the world of Power BI, writing a bunch of DAX videos, doing those, authoring those. Uh, and I'm still going to be doing DAX videos. So if you're coming here and you're like, no, you're switching it up, I'm going to be doing both. A little bit of Data Factory, a little bit of Azure. And of course, I'm going to keep doing DAX as well. But we're going to be taking a look at Wrangling Data Flows. Wrangling Data Flows is a preview feature that has, quite frankly, been in preview for a very long time. It has some limitations, but what is it? What is a Wrangling Data Flow? A Wrangling Data Flow is essentially what we have in Power BI Desktop and also what we have in Excel. It's the ability to use the UI to transform and clean our data, to apply business logic to our data. It is a very powerful tool, uh, but in, in inside of Azure Data Factory, it is in preview. And so it does currently have some limitations and it is nowhere near nowhere near the experience that we get with Power BI. That's why I've actually held off this long to do this video, but it is time. It's time to get back into Data Factory. So we're going to take a look today at building a data flow that uses a Wrangling data flow, building that out. What are some of the limitations and how does that work? So that you know, what happens with a Wrangling data flow is you're essentially using the same query language you use in Power BI or Excel. You're using the Elm query language in the background. And what a Wrangling data flow does is it takes that query language, it translates it to Spark, and it runs it against data clusters, really big data clusters in the background so that you have that scalability, but you don't have to translate the code to Spark. You don't have to know Spark. You don't have to know how to go and spin up and provision those big data clusters. It just happens in the background, very similar to what happens with a mapping data flow. Mapping data flow being what is more familiar to us with regards to like typical business intelligence, SSIS, uh, SQL Server Integration Services, so on and so forth. So let's jump right in. Let's start the demo. I'm going to, in my Azure Data Factory here, I am going to create a new mapping data flow. Now, what's interesting is when I create a new mapping data flow by clicking on that ellipsis right there, what it actually is doing in here is it's going to let me choose a Wrangling data flow that is in preview. So we're going to choose that and click OK. And then it brings us to this screen right here. And this screen right here says, all right, you need your source data set. You can do one, you can do two, you can do more than one data set, which is what I'm going to do. So I'll add another data set. And then I've created, I'll show you in a moment, those data sets that I've created. But I've created really three data sets for this, two source data sets and then one destination. So I'm going to bring in my BMI, body mass index. And then I'm also going to bring in, see if I can find it here. I do not see, oh, I gotta scroll down a little bit. I was like, it's missing, but it's not, it's right there. All right, so then I'm gonna bring in my total population and then you have to tell it where you're gonna load this data when you are done. And I am going to load this data over to, where do we wanna load it? It's gonna be world data, all right? So BMI, total population, and when we're done merging those data sets together, creating one data set, we're gonna then load it into a new file that's been cleaned and it's been provisioned and it has been curated, all right? And so then we click OK. This is going to tell you across the top, hey, not all Power Query slash Elm functions are available, are supported currently for this kind of wrangling data flow functionality. And over here, if you open up that tab that it opens automatically, it has some really good information in here. So I would encourage you to kind of dig through this. You know I like to keep these videos short, 10, 15 minutes. I don't like to stretch out what doesn't need to be stretched out. So you can go and look at this on your own time, but this is essentially what is supported. So you can do things like select columns. You can remove columns. You can rename or reorder columns. You can also do row filtering, so you can filter it down. You can go in here and do a lot of these type of functions here. You can merge functions. You can do group by. You can do sorting. You can reduce rows by using table.range, table.min in, min max. So that's like keep this number of rows or so on and so forth. And here's where I was trying to get to, right here, known unsupported functions. Now, I will put this URL in the link for the video below so that if it's not there when you go to doing wrangling data flows, here you go. But you cannot promote headers. So when you bring in that data set, make sure when you bring in your data set, you promote the headers right then. Um, you cannot do a nested join. 
You cannot do a table dot distinct. You cannot do a row count. You cannot do a pivot or an unpivot. That, that was the biggest um, letdown for me. Promoted headers, a little bit odd. But yeah, these are things you can't do. Keep in mind that the Microsoft team is having to take this language and translate it to a completely different language and run it against big data clusters. So I'm sure there's a lot of work in the background to make these things work, but that's that. So what are we going to do? Well, we have this screen right here, and this looks very similar to, once again, the Power Query editor, or if you've worked with Power Query in Excel, we have that UI experience, that clicky, clicky, draggy, draggy, droppy, droppy uh, experience that has been coined by Microsoft and one of their project managers, Christopher Finland, I think. Uh, so there you go. You have that drag and drop experience. And so what I want to do is show you what comes in here, right? So the first thing you see is we have our BMI source and we have our total population source. And then we have our user query. Now, if you're like me, the first thing you're going to do when you come in here is you're going to say, all right, let's name this world data because we're going to be merging these together. This is going to be world data, but it throws an error. You can't do that. It says it must be user query or the data set name referenced by the data flow. So I got to change that back to user query. There's actually a lot of anomalies here. There's a lot of oddities uh, that you've got to work through. And if you come up to your BMI or your total population, one thing I learned is I don't really want to do a lot of data transformation on this original query, specifically naming the columns, because if I go in there and I change the column name to country instead of lowercase country, it complains later on and it doesn't work. So when you start playing with this, once again, there's going to be quite a few oddities. But this is our country data. This is our BMI data by country, by year. And then over here, we have our total population by country, by year. And what I want to do with those data sets is I want to merge them together in this new query so we have one version of the truth, just one file that merges them. So on total population, I am going to go ahead and change my attribute column, which is my year. I'll click right here at the very top. Tell it, let's change the data type to a whole number. Really clean, really cool experience here. Um, for the value, the value is my total population. I'm going to change that as well to total population. All right. And then on BMI, I'm going to come back over here. I'll change that to a whole number as well. And then for the, the BMI, so that was the year, we changed the year to a whole number. For the actual BMI value, I'm going to change that to a decimal. Once again, I kind of wait until after the fact to rename the columns because of something I've noticed when I'm doing the merge where it uh, starts to give me error messages. So I'm going to go down to user query here. And then what I want to do is let's merge these two together. So the original query that it gives me is the BMI. I want to add to that the total population. And if you've done this in Power Query, this is all review for you, right? If you're new to this, if you've been using mapping data flows, Maybe you start to look at this and say, wait a minute, this is really cool and a really easy way to clean my data up and to prepare it. So then over here, what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the right, click on Merge Queries, and I'm going to merge my original query over to the total population. So I'm going to merge those two together, and I'm going to merge it. Actually, I'm going to do the join on two separate columns. So we're going to do it on the country and the year. So I'll multi-select those, and then down here, I'll grab country and I'll hold down the control button, click the attribute there, which is my year as well. And I'm going to do an inner join. So only bring back the rows from each table that have a corresponding match in each table, right? So if you have, for example, Afghanistan 1800 in the total population table, but there's no match in the BMI table, which there isn't because the BMI table starts at 1980, then what we're saying is get rid of all of those rows that don't have a match. So then down here at the bottom, you see very clearly, it's going to return 5,481 out of 18,000 rows in the second table because there's about 13,000 rows in the second table that don't have a match in the first table. That's exactly what I want for this scenario. So we're going to click OK, and then it's going to go through the process now of merging those together. Now, I do get a little bit of an error message, but it's just saying that, all right, you've created a join, you've done a merge, you now need to expand that table which is right here, right? So once again, very similar to that Power Query experience, we're gonna click the button right here at the top right to expand that out. I do not wanna use the original column name of AZ blob total population. Uh, we don't want that to prefix all of our columns. And I also don't want country or attribute because we already have that. So we're just gonna bring in the population or that value column and then click okay. 
And then once this loads in a minute, we're going to have one table that has all of our data in it. And this is the point that I've learned I want to start renaming my column. So I'll go ahead and name this one country real quick. And then I can come over to the year and then we'll rename this one to year. I'll double click on the BMI here. We'll name it BMI. And then finally, the last one is going to be population. All the way over here on the right, we have all of those applied steps. It's keeping track of all the work we do. If you're familiar with Power Query Editor, there's a lot more we can do here. We can remove columns. We can remove rows. Remember, there are certain operations that are still supported. We can add new columns like a conditional column. You can add an index column. You can right click. You can come down to transform columns and you can do things like make it uppercase, make it lowercase, trim, clean. So there's a lot we can do in here. A lot of functionality that existed in Power Query Editor still exists, but today and for a long time now, there have been quite a few limitations that exist as well. So this is it. We're actually done. We've, we've done the work that we want to do. And so right here, we've created a new data flow called Wrangling Data Flow. Now we could have given it a better name, but I'm not worried about that for this video. What I do want to do next though, is we want to run this. We want to run it and then over here, see if when I run that data factory um, data flow, if it is going to write that data over here to my world data. Now you can see I already ran through this. I already did this demo. So let me go back in here real quick and I'm going to actually delete real quick. We're going to get rid of that container and let's go ahead and create the container anew. So world data, we'll create it again. And there we go. So now we have our world data. So we can come over here now and run this. And the way we run any data factory data flow is we run it from a pipeline. So we're going to create a new pipeline here. And in this pipeline, all I'm going to do is bring in a data flow activity. And this data flow activity will allow us to execute or essentially run an existing data flow that we have created. So I am going to choose my Wrangling data flow that we created just a moment ago, click OK, and then right here, there we go, it's ready to go. We can run this in debug mode. We could of course publish it and then trigger that and run it. But what I'm going to do is go ahead and hit debug. I've already got my debug turned on. So this should actually run relatively quickly here. And the cool thing about this as it's running is that because you execute it from a pipeline, you could have a series of activities that are moving data around that are copying data. Once the data has been copied and moved into your blob storage account, you pick it up with your wrangling data flow, you clean that data up, you modify it, you apply business rules, and then you load it right into your destination. Now our destination is very simply, we're putting it, we're moving it from one data lake container or one blob, I think I'm using blob storage account here, from one blob storage account to another blob storage account container. And so all we're doing is just moving it, but we're curating it, we're cleaning it up, we're applying our business rules, and therefore we can use it. And it says that it has succeeded successfully. It took about 33 seconds to do. And if we go back over to our storage account and go into that world data right here, if you've ever worked with Spark or you've worked with Databricks, uh, you might be familiar with what it's doing here, but it shows us that it started, committed, success. Here is the actual file that got created. So I'm going to click on that file and then we'll click on edit. And here we go. We can see that the data is there. We have our country, our year, our BMI, and our population all in one, one file. And that's it. All right. As always, thank you for watching this video. Once again, if you like this, hit like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.